Thanks for tuning in to the Stone Creek Coffee Podcast. I'm Drew Pond. I'm one of the co-owners at Stone Creek and general host of the podcast. Today's a bit of a special episode. Um, since May 25th, with the killing of George Floyd, um, we've been at a pretty uh, heightened state of tension <laughs> in the United States, and particularly heightened state of, of racial tension. Like the issue of racism, both systemic and personal, is really, really pronounced right now in our country. And as a company, like we're not gonna presume to be able to diagnose root cause or outline, hey, here's what we need to do like to fix everything. Like we're, we're a coffee company. Um, but what we do want to do is we just want to provide a forum for learning. This podcast, since we started it, has always been about learning. And um, you know, part of learning is gaining new perspectives, perspectives you didn't necessarily have in and of yourself. And so today's episode is about gaining a perspective. And so in this particular episode, I have a conversation with Happy Musanda, who's our cafe coach in one of our cafes, that's the leader in one of our cafes. And Happy, uh, in the midst of what our city and our country is facing, spoke up to us and said, hey, I want to help. Like, I just want to offer my perspective. I want to help people learn if, you know, if they desire to be an advocate for black lives or, or they're just trying to learn about the issue of systemic or personal racism, like, I want to help. And that was an incredible offer to our company. And, and so I'm so thrilled then to be able to share this conversation with you um, that we were able to have both like for, for the sake of our company and Stone Creek and everything we want it to be. And then so our guests and partners can really uh, understand what's at the heart of Stone Creek, but really more importantly, at the heart of the amazing people that we have working with and, and for us. And I would just say if anybody at Stone Creek would certainly say that Happy is just an amazing example of, of grace and love and humor and empathy. And so to be able to have this conversation with him is, is a real privilege for me, and I'm excited to share it with you. Let's get rolling. <laughs> Happy, dude, thank you so much for like having the conversation. Yeah, thanks for um, having me. Yeah, I like in the midst of everything that's going on in, in today's world, it just feels like important to talk. Like we're here today to just have like a transparent conversation as much as we possibly can with cameras on and recording. Yeah. Um, but I feel like that that is one of the missing ingredients right now in our society. Like there is a lot of advocacy for good. Uh, there's a pronounced voice for people through social media who maybe didn't have it before um, to reach broad society and all that's great but with that comes this uh sometimes rough dynamic where it's a lot of people shouting and not very many people talking so i think that this is is an important forum for us to try and do some good yeah um, for sure like how do, how do you make sense of all that that's going on um in terms of the amount of tension that exists mm -hmm. just right now particularly in the u.s and even in our city uh so for me as i've mentioned to you before it just ends up with me thinking about what is my experience mm -hmm. in everything. Because I think once you start thinking about, you know, what have I gone through, what have I seen, what have, you know, I had to deal with, you can start painting more of a picture of how other people's experiences fare with you. Mm -hmm. And I do agree. It ends up a lot of times just being shouting, like, you know, this is what I've seen, so this is point blank, that's period. And it needs to be a give and take. Hey, this is my experience as a black man. I, you know, went through this in elementary school. I went through this in college. I go through this at work, and then if you are talking to a white person, they can be like, "I didn't know that." Thanks for telling me. This is my experience as a white man. You know, whether it's in Milwaukee or in the U.S., and then I really think you can start having meaningful conversations. Mm. You know, you can kind of start figuring out where's where can that compromise begin where can that understanding begin to you know my experience will never be your experience your sure. experience will never be mine but there's got to be some middle ground there you know yeah. that we can both have equality both have justice and both be able to work together to kind of build the country we want to see mm. yeah i think it's we want to be on a journey in search of empathy mm -hmm. like and it's hard to do that maybe in the digital forum. I think it's definitely possible, but it's harder for sure. But when we're able to sit down and just talk, and, and sh I like what you said about sharing a perspective. Like, listen, 
this is what I've encountered in my life. Hopefully it's helpful for your learning yeah. like, cause, and, and helps you be a little bit more empathetic. Um, but that's what it is. Like mm-hmm. you can't change what my experience has been. You can't change my perspective. Like no. that is what it is. But together we can like inform each other. And particularly now, like I want to be in the seat of learning. Like mm-hmm. uh, and and I mean, you spoke up to us and and, and said, "Listen, I want to I want to I want to share." And the Stone Creek Coffee Podcast has been really about that. You know, sharing sort of our our company story and our journey with coffee, and that's been great. Yeah. But within the last couple of years, um, we really wanted it to be more and be a forum for learning for people and a forum to have other people share their life experiences with you know, our guests and with our company. So again, thanks for for being willing to do this. Yeah. Thank um, you. Because. You know, in in radical transparency, there are many people like me who grew up in in suburbs as a, a fairly privileged white dude, um, <laughs> who who as much as I might try, it's going to be tough for me for or for somebody like me to be empathetic without having good relationships and having heard mm-hmm. specifically from a black man about what was life like, what is life like, yep. and yep. and how can we work together, as you said, to build equality for everybody exactly yeah. so so let's start with the your upbringing yeah. um let's start with growing up as happy like our, our kind of theme today is what is it like to be happy to be happy in milwaukee to be happy in coffee but let's just start with what was it like to be happy growing up uh so that kind of a long story that's kind of brought me to where i am today so I was originally born in Zambia. Um, it's like two countries above, above South Africa for mm. people that don't know. And no, it's not Zimbabwe. I two get different places. <laughs> very two different countries next to each other, but different countries. So I was born there. It is a developing country, sadly. And with that came both of my parents actually passing away. So I ended up being adopted, still in the family. My uncle adopted me, come to America, and I've kind of spent all my life in the Midwest. I've lived in Minnesota, Michigan, Illinois. Uh, His job made him move around a lot, so Mm -hmm. I ended up moving around. And with being in the Midwest and sort of always living in suburbs, you know, my experience was that I had diversity around me. Because in Minnesota, I lived in Minneapolis Mm -hmm. around the city. So you have a lot of diversity there. Uh, in Michigan, I lived in Kalamazoo, a little bit of diversity there too. And then in Illinois, I lived in the South suburbs of Chicago, a lot of diversity. So I was able to see all these different experiences that everyone kind of, you know, gets and everyone kind of, uh, has. And for me, obviously being black, like to paint a picture for you, like six year old happy is living in a developing country. Places like America, England, those are almost seen like the promised land mm-hmm. for, you know, someone who's in a developing country. So, you you know, I come here and I'm like, sweet. <laughs> I'm, I'm in, you know, freaking America. I'm yeah. here, you know, land of the free, home of the brave. I can't wait. But then slowly you start seeing like the, the peels of the onion slowly coming off. Like, mm. hey, happy when you go to the store, keep your hands out of your pockets just in case. Hey, if you're talking to a cop. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Be respectful. You know, little things like that, slowly you start seeing. You're watching the news. You're like, that's weird how, you know, that portrayal is. You know, little things start kind of being embedded in your brain as to what my role as a black man, as a black boy at that time is in America. And obviously, you know, we move around high school. I come here and um, I actually went to Franklin and mm-hmm. Oak Creek. That's where mm-hmm. I graduated. And... It's very obvious when you can just kind of see how, you know, everyone is treated differently based on their race. And, you know, this is something I brought up to you before that I've appreciated the people that come out and say, I do see your race. Mm. Because when people say, I don't see color, I don't see race, you then, you know, negate what it is to be black, what it is to be Mexican, what it is to be white, because we're all treated differently. We might not want to. But it's almost like innate in us to treat someone differently based off previous prejudices that we have. Mm. Obviously, like you said, Milwaukee, you know, up there is one of the most segregated cities in America. I've felt it, you know, Mm. and I uh, used to live on the east side. And anytime I would be talking to someone, a lot of times a white person and they'll be like, oh, where do you live? I lived on Locust and Bartlett. So I'd be like, oh, I live, you know, 
on Locust Street. And I'd be like, where on Locust Street do you live? <laughs> Everyone in Milwaukee knows they're two different Milwaukee, you know? <laughs> two different Locust Streets? Two or? different, you know, if you say, oh, I live, you know, on Locust in Maryland. Okay, sweet. Oh, I live on like 7th and Locust. Yeah. You instantly have, you know, so yeah. this kind of goes back to that. Like, you don't even try to, you know, think of someone different, but just based off of where they said they live, you're already judging mm -hmm. them. You're already prejudging them. So let's, if you don't mind, let's go back uh, to high school days a little yeah. bit in Oak yeah. Creek, Franklin. So I currently live in Oak Creek. Oh, sweet. Uh, yeah. Yep. Where do you um, live? I live uh, closer to the lake. I live okay. off Ryan, um, so just south of Ryan, closer to the lake. Um, and it's an interesting neighborhood. Um, but I, even before we get to that, I'm, I'm a little bit all over the place, but I did want to say that you said something that I wanted to jump off of, mm -hmm. um, as we, we talk more about race and, and really offer up you know, your perspective and, uh, what it is to, to live as a black man in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mentioned to you on the phone when we talked about having this conversation, like I would want to own that this is like, it feels uncomfortable for me to say <laughs> like, all right, we're going to, I'm going to host a podcast episode and I'm, the subject matter is going to be, what's it going to be like, or what is it like to be a black man in Milwaukee? Because it almost feels inappropriate. Like for me to, say, all right, Happy, I want you to talk about being black. <laughs> like, that feels like a line you shouldn't necessarily cross. Yeah. But you and many others have been helpful to me, particularly over the last several months in learning, hey, listen, it's, it's not about ignoring your blackness at all. Like, that's almost part of the problem. Yeah, it probably is part of the problem. Yeah. It's about, like, it's about recognizing it and celebrating it, not using it as any cause for discrimination um but but using it as something that is that that's part of what makes you you yep um and that should be celebrated and should be lauded in our society whereas it's often used as a cause for division mm -hmm. so i would i appreciate those who have been willing to correct my thinking on that like it's not about being colorblind colorblind mm -hmm. is sort of it's a wrong mentality yeah. where it is about recognizing equality in the differences. Yep, yeah. So getting back to high school, yeah, high school. Um, you know, the Oak Creek Franklin School District is generally regarded as, you know, one of the best, uh, you know, in the surrounding area, but it's also not as diverse as some of the other areas. So maybe you can share, like, you know, as, as you grew up, you know, were there particular moments in your life or in your education, in your interactions with others where, where you particularly felt like I'm a like a minority. So one thing that once again this is just my experience and one thing I encountered in high school that you know made you feel that kind of like, oh, okay. Uh there's this thing that people say that sometimes comes across as wanting to be nice, but it's kind of coded with racism and it's when someone uses the word the phrase which I heard in high school, you talk white. So that was one big thing for me in high school. Like, you know, I did my best. You know, I studied hard. So I was like in AP classes, AP English, AP psych, all these. And that was usually the thing. It's like, oh, wow, happy, you're black, but you're not like other black people, you know? And then obviously at that time, like I'm, you know, 16, 17, I'm like, whatever. Sure. But I would love to be able to go back and be like, what do you mean? And I think if you were to ask someone that, they would be left with no other answer but that, well, I'm judging you differently than I would judge, like, those people or, you know, those other black people yeah. simply because of how you're dictating yourself. And uh, I, it happened to me as well my, before I came to Stone Creek. I was a waiter, and that was also another thing where, you know, you see this black guy come up to your table. He's got the locks. You're like, I wonder. And usually the thing was, oh, wow, you're... You sound very well educated. And I'm like, I highly, you know, I really don't think you're probably saying that to, you know, this white waiter that you have to be like, you sure. sound, you know? Yeah, and that's yeah. because you have that prejudging. But anyway, going back to high school, yeah, that was the main thing of where, you know, my white friends would treat me differently. I'm black. You know, if I'm on the street and 
someone wants to commit a hate crime against me, they're not gonna run up to me and say, hey, can you say a quick sentence for me? <laughs> just so I can gauge which black, which kind of black person you are. I'm still t you know, treated the same as every black person, educated, uneducated. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. So for there to be that kind of like, oh, you know, I'm going to like you because of the way you speak, even I'm still black. Sure. You know, my skin color can still be a crime is a crime it feels like sometimes so and like i said i wish i could go back and just kind of dig more into that but yeah that was that was high school <laughs> yeah and i think that's a really important thing for us to recognize um and i grew up in texas mm -hmm. um which is a unique environment <laughs> but it, i mean in growing up in that kind of environment and in my own ignorance you know there uh, what you said about like that sort of filtering of like well you, you very well spoken yeah. for a black man like that is not an unusual statement and it's it's often it's not because like people are they have ill will behind it they're just not thinking through like that is actually like a racist filter that you very. put up in your brain it's not that you're necessarily intentionally racist although many people are mm -hmm. um but you're you're actually ignorant of your the racism that's in your brain, yeah. and um, it, it requires you to be have really a radical amount of openness to assess yourself and the filters that do come into your brain to say, listen, do I have racial bias that I'm unaware of? Because if that is like how you perceive your waiter or your friend or yeah. whatever, then like that is the result of you know racial conditioning or racist mm -hmm. conditioning. You need to be aware of. And I think that's one of the hardest things that a lot of people need to start doing is realizing that from the moment you're born, you're like, you know, we keep throwing the word around, you know, systemic racism. And people need to understand how ingrained it is into our society, into our culture. You know, from the moment you're born, you go to school. I mean, I, ima I can't imagine telling you know a nine or ten year old don't do this don't do that don't do this don't do that because of your skin color mm. like imagine the development of a child at nine or ten and that's what you're telling them and that's what they're starting to kind of you know be programmed to them to, you know into their head and people need to start realizing that it's it's so deeply rooted in you know hundreds and hundreds of years of racism and you got to start peeling those layers back. Like you said, you want to say a statement, you're like, I wonder if, you know, how is this being perceived? Because like those people that say, oh, wow, you sound educated. They're like, that's a compliment. I'm telling him he's educated. Mm -hmm. And well, it doesn't come across that way, sure. you know, because I, once again, maybe I'm wrong, but I highly doubt you're telling that to like, you know, your white friend who you just see, like you're probably not because of the expectation of what it means to be white versus what it means to be black. Yeah. Moving on from your high school days, so you graduate uh, Oak Creek Franklin School District. Um, then what? Like, how do you go from there to sitting on this couch today? Uh, another long story. Uh, uh, I think we got time. <laughs> yeah, we're doing okay on time. I kind of bounced all over after high school. I actually went to uh, Ventura, California for a little bit. Mm. I was going to go to college there. That didn't pan out, so I come back to the Midwest. Uh, and then I started going to UWM. I went there with a political science major, which I hated. Okay. <laughs> hated so much. I feel like there's a lot behind that. What did you hate about it? I'm just not like a sit down, you know, read books, okay. do that sort of thing. At that time, I think I was starting to discover that I like being on my feet. I like talking with people. Mm. I like, you know, I'm very animated at times. I'm like the introverted extrovert that, ever, you know, everyone keeps talking about. So... Uh, eventually, after a long, long period of time, I eventually switched my major to uh, acting. So okay. I was pursuing a BFA in acting. And that was great, obviously. But that was also another part. I mean, you know, the acting industry, it's another whole conversation about how race plays into that. Um, would you mind sharing a little bit of what you experienced? Like in starting school or... Did you start school in California? No, I never did. Oh, okay. I never did. Um, so not too much at UWM just because they do try to be as diverse as sure. possible. But I mean, you know, you start off with a lot of plays. 
there are a lot of plays, you know, a lot of like the classics we talk about, they're mm-hmm. not made for black actors or black actresses. They're made for white actors and white actresses. You know, the names in the plays and all of this and, you know, the classic, you know, black plays you're going to do are August Wilson. Because, you know, that's kind of like not the only thing. There are plenty out there, but that's like the one thing that, you know, the classic that people turn to. Um, and like I said, I didn't feel too much of that at UWM mm-hmm. in terms of how they handle their acting department. I had really great professors and um, I was even given given a chance to uh, play the lead in one play. So that was a great, great opportunity. But yeah, so while I'm there, I start working at Olive Garden. Oh, Olive Garden. <laughs> <laughs> that was a crazy time. Um, what was crazy about it? So, not even speaking like on in the on the race part of it, just like the service industry culture. That was my first like service industry job. Mm-hmm. You know, you're talking to strangers a lot of time. You're trying to, you know, almost like please the stranger a lot of times, and that comes with a lot of just you know learning, and you know that's one of those things to where like as a black man you approach a table of white people and you don't know how they perceive you and you just kind of have to go in there blind and hope for the best. I can't think of too many examples to where it was like, oh, wow, this was a thing. Like I said before, a lot of the times it was, you know, if I go up to a table and it's, you know, dear, sweet, 67-year-old white women and, you know, at the very end, it's like, oh, you're not what we expected. (laughs) And it's like, thank you. I appreciate that. But. but I wish I could explain to you what that means to me. Yeah. So that was those little, you know, sentences here and there were the main thing of that. And then I remember I went to, at that time I was banking at Wells Fargo. So mm-hmm. I went to the Wells Fargo right next to Stone Creek in Shorewood. All right. Yep. And while I was there, uh, one of the bankers was like, hey, if you're looking for another job, Stone Creek is always hiring. <laughs> I went home, I put an application for Stone Creek. Uh, about a couple of days later, got a call from Sam Woman. He All was right. like, hey, I'd like to bring him for an interview. I was late to that interview. To the gr- <laughs> I was late to the group interview. Then I was also late to the f- interview with Sam. Wow. Yeah, I, I, and you guys hired me. And uh, yeah, that's how I started at Stone Creek. All right. Um, so when, how old were you when you moved to uh, the Milwaukee area? I was a sophomore in high school, so okay. 15, 16, Got yeah. Got it. And when did you first hear, like, all right, Milwaukee is one of the most segregated cities in the United States. Some some have said it's the most segregated, yeah. but, you know, reports differ. But. I think it wasn't until college. Okay. Um, didn't really feel it in high school and could be maybe a, a little sheltered. I don't know. But in college, that's when, once again, you're kind of like, hey, I want to go to this part of Milwaukee. And they're like... No, 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 you don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, oh, I live here. Oh, okay. The kind of that prejudging of where sure. someone lives. And that's when you start to kind of feel it. And I was still learning and growing. And, that you know, that's one of the really sad things about the systemic racism that's in America is not only does it affect black people physically in terms of, you know, death and crime, and it affects black people mentally you know inferior inferiority complex is a thing Mm -hmm. that a lot of black people have come out and said yeah you tell someone hundreds of years that you're worth nothing you're three-fifths of the person you know if you think you're a man you're not a man you know if you're a woman you're going to get raped and tort you tell someone that enough they start to believe it Mm. you know and i think that's another whole subject another whole topic that can be tackled yeah yeah <laughs> it'd be nice if we would be able to sort of prescribe solutions the the issues are so deeply rooted I mean, because they're there long before the foundation of our country you know the, the racial dynamics the conditioning then that happened uh, as a result of that the legislation that happened as a result of that that further embedded the conditioning as you said at the start of the conversation like that t- what what is hundreds of years like 500 years 600 or 400 years ingrained in this particular country doesn't get unraveled over the course of, you know, 
40 years. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So it'd be na- we'd be naive to, th- to think that. So let's, we'll come back to Milwaukee in a minute. Yeah. But, you know, you've mentioned the issue of systemic racism. And one of the, that's, that phrase is one of the things that gets, that triggers people. It's, it's hard for people to accept that as a, a reality mm-hmm. because they don't want to be racist and they love the country. This is my assessment. I think they don't want to be racist and they love the country. They don't want the country to be racist. Mm-hmm. How can a country be racist? People are <laughs> racist. And so when the fr- phrase uh, systemic racism is used, it's like, well, that, you know, that's not a thing. How, mm-hmm. Like if, if you're being radically transparent, what would you want to say to somebody who would deny the realities of systemic racism? I mean, apart from just being blunt and just saying, like, open your fucking eyes, like, it, there's only so much you can show someone, and there's only so much you can tell someone. And, I mean, if I, I, I really would not know what to say to a person that constantly keeps denying the systemic racism that is present, because you can show people the history. You can, like you said, the legislation. That's another whole, you know, topic. And I think until you either find some sort of sympathy or empathy within yourself to realize what millions of people go through on a daily basis, then you're part of the problem. You may not want to be racist. You know, I just, I see it every day. I'm not racist, but I'm not racist, but you don't have to say that, you know? If you really wholeheartedly believe you're not racist, well, then what are your actions say, you know, saying and what are your words saying? If you have to put a butt next to something, you're defeating the purpose of you thinking you're not racist or, you know, I don't want to be racist. And the people that keep thinking that way just really need to listen, 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 listen. Just listen as much as you can. Learn as much as you can. You know, ask questions. It will be uncomfortable very uncomfortable at times. You might hear things you don't want to hear. You you know, you will hear stories you don't want to hear. But while you're hearing them, remember that someone lived through that or someone is living through that. And that's a lot worse than you sit, sitting there listening to their story. I can't imagine as much racism as I faced there are so many other black people that have faced so much more than I have. And so when I, as a black person, listen to these stories, listen to these cries, I'm, you know, like, I can't imagine having any sense or any sliver of emotion or empathy to just feel for them and start learning how you can help, Mm. how, you know, the conversation started at the family table, you know. Uncle John over here says something. You're like, hey, whoa, hey. Do you understand what you're saying? Or, you know, your mom maybe says something. And you're hanging out with your friends. You know, you're out. I, you know, not to be too crass, but I have a lot of white friends that I could name who love throwing around the N-word. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's a good place to start right there. Hey, no, come on. You know, and it starts in small groups. Call people out. Yeah. Call the racists out. Let them know, hey, that is not cool. And then, you know, you, you can start weeding them out and you can start. And that's a great thing with social media these days is it's very easy to see those people who are posting certain things, who are responding to certain things. And you can be like, hey, no, this is what you're doing. You, you know, need to lose your job. You need to be called out for what you're saying, for what you're doing. Because especially the people in power, you know, if you're a president of a company, CEO of a company, and you're saying certain things, well, imagine all the trickle-down racism that's happening to your hires, mm. to the opportunities you're giving, you know, to people who apply to your job. So, like, it, and it just starts in those little circles to call people out. Mm. I get why people don't want to do it. It's uncomfortable. Like, yeah, it's really it's uncomfortable. very uncomfortable. Not to make any excuse at all, but in some cases it means that, you know, what what it means you will sacrifice. So what's helpful to understand is listen, like um as a white dude, I can probably stand to sacrifice a little bit. <laughs> like it, our our country is generally built for me. And yeah. um 
that's so so some people would say i'm not going to apologize for that well that, okay fine i guess i'm not going to apologize for it either but i'm going to be aware of it and try and change it because mm -hmm. it's like certainly i've benefited from things and it's not necess it's not that i did anything wrong mm -hmm. necessarily but that does mean that like if it, if not everybody was given the opportunities that i was given or had as little red tape to go through as i had to go through like let's make the world better then so that other people can experience life that way and if that means that i give up a little bit that's probably fine like, yeah and then that can also lead into the conversation of white privilege and then also equality versus equity mm. you know um i want to get this out there that white privilege does not mean you haven't struggled white privilege does not mean that oh maybe you weren't poor or you got turned away for jobs or you know you were maybe hit or any anything negative that happened to you like that doesn't mean if you have white privilege you lived a you know what's that saying you know silver spoon life mm. it just means none of those things happened to you because you were white mm. and I'll even give you the benefit of the doubt because I've had some friends, you know, retaliate with this. Well, actually, I'm pretty sure this black guy did so and so because I was white. Well, the system is built so that you can survive that one little encounter if that was the case. If you wholeheartedly believe that you didn't get this job because this, you know, black guy that was doing the hiring didn't hire you because you're white, okay? We can take a look at the numbers of how many Fortune 500 companies are led by white people, and I'm I have a feeling you'll be all right. And then you take that conversation of white privilege into equality and equity, realizing that black people and people of color will need that helping hand up. You know, because let's take the example of hiring. That You know, that's always a good one. You can say, you know, I've had people counter with, oh, well, the laws are there that, you know, you can't be you know, discriminated against, uh, discriminated against based on your race when it comes to hiring. And it's like, well, that's really false, as can be shown from major sports to major, like, it's all through, you can see that there is discrimination there. How they might hire, for example, maybe, oh, we only do online hires. Hmm. Well, if someone is living in a poor neighborhood and maybe they don't have access to internet, you just disqualify them instantly. And most of the neighborhoods will probably, most of the poor neighborhoods due to a long history of, you know, redlining and really, really bad, you know, real estate practices will have black people in there. So that's the discrimination based mm -hmm. on their race. And they had nothing to do with that. So the equity that would be needed would be saying, oh, you know, we're going to do online hires, but also we will do paper hires or, you know, whatever the case. You go that extra step further, realizing that the white privilege you have benefits you in that situation, benefits you in that scenario, mm -hmm. just because simply based on where you might have been born, where you live, you have that privilege instantly. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, those. it's just all really, really good to reflect on. I, I remember a key moment, and there are many key moments, and will be more, not like I'm done, but a, an important mo moment in my learning was sort of the understanding, particularly in reference to hiring, you know, I... I went to college, got a business degree, but just in understanding the forms that discrimination can take even when we're unaware of it. Like, mm -hmm. as you said, it's not even just about saying, like, I'm providing an equal format. Like, here's how we hire. It's online. It's open to anybody. Anybody who wants it can go get it. To saying, like, listen, that's just not the reality of yeah. our lives. Like, it may be the reality for the community that I'm most closely associated with, yes, yeah, but yeah. not for everybody. And so you, it requires, like, a deep intentionality and empathy to say, well, if it's going to be truly equitable, that means that everybody has equal opportunity, like an actual yeah. equal opportunity. So for some people, that means you only have to go so far to provide them that opportunity. For other people, it means you need to go a whole lot further. Exactly. So that distinction between, hey, it's just out there for somebody versus, no, we have to go offer it to the person and mm -hmm. give them, provide them what we call reasonable accommodation to mm -hmm. attain it. Um, like that's what true equity would be. Yeah. And the same thing can be said for education. Mm. You know, you kind of have like this blanket statement of like, well, everyone has, you know, the opportunity to go to school. Everyone has the, you know, means necessary to, 
you know, achieving, you know, higher education. And it's like, well, that's sadly not the reality, you know, based off of property taxes and how a certain neighborhood probably can afford more, can afford to give more to a quality education than another neighborhood probably won't be able to. And not from a fault of their own, but from years of discrimination when it comes to you know, real estate practices, when it comes to the white migration, mm -hmm. you know, all these things that have led up to a point to where, well, why don't you just go to school and get an education? Well, you've made it really, really <laughs> difficult along the way. You know, they tried and yeah. they were taking a step back. You know, businesses were shut down or, you know, they weren't given grants that other people might have gotten. And there needs to be that, like, extra hand, you know, mm -hmm. extra foot yeah. you go, extra mile you go to realize, okay, they already have this in place. They don't. Yes, in, you know, on a general, like in a perfect world, they're equal, but they're not. They both have schools, but what are the schools, you know, what do they look like inside? What kind of books do they have? What kind of, te how much are the teachers getting paid? That's always a great one, you know? And it's like, once you start, you know, digging deeper, you can realize, okay, this is what we need to do to actually get them up onto the same plane. Yeah, yeah, and it would require going further in mm -hmm. a lot of instances. Um, and I do think that the, the redlining issue, um, the, the, I mean, the sort of ingrained segregation made mm -hmm. it hard for segregation to end, and you see it really pronounced in Milwaukee. Yeah. Like, that is really at the heart of a lot of systemic racism issues and so if, if somebody's wondering is this systemic racism a thing like I would just challenge them to like hey you need to go read about what redlining yeah. was if you're not aware of like how bank loans were structured for people wanting to buy houses which is how we really accumulate wealth yeah. in western civ um, if you're not familiar with how that all was built you've got to go read about it because exactly. you're not going to understand the, the disadvantage mm -hmm. that our country put um, black Americans in. Yeah. And then, of course, there's incarceration issues as well. There's many others, but we yeah. only have so much time today. Right. Yeah. No, redlining well, would be a great place to start because you can see it. You can yeah. see what the legislation was. You can see how it was, you know, handled, how it was enforced. And now, 30, 40 years later, you're seeing, wow, this is what did to this community. And from that community, you know, begets crime and all this, you know, negative negativity. But then for you to turn around and say, well, why don't you just, or why don't you just, well. Yeah, you pull yourself up. Man. You know, bootstrap, yeah. kind of like, yeah. pull yourself from the bootstrap. Well, no, because you did so much. You <laughs> did, you're like, I don't have any bootstraps. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So, um, yeah, I, I, somebody shared on Instagram this week uh, a picture of the redlining, uh, initial redlining districtization uh, that was done in Milwaukee and then current Milwaukee crime rates. It was mm -hmm. really remarkable. Um, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, and just, you know, it's, it's a mirror image. Um, yeah. So, yeah, if, uh, where's the camera? Read about redlining. <laughs> if you have not already, it'd be beneficial um, and humbling. Humbling yeah. for sure. Um, so let's get to happy in Milwaukee. So, you know, you, you grow up, you become more aware of, you know, this city um, and uh, I say it's state. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how do you how do you process that? Like, how is that? Like, what do you think? What do you feel? I guess a great starting point would be like, I hope I'm not wrong on this, but. I want to say Eric Garner was in 2014, 14 or 16. But I want to say 14. Um, you, you, like happy in Milwaukee, you know, you start processing these things. You know, you start realizing how, like how prominent the racism is. And now, obviously, the issue is police brutality and police killings. And those are the people you expect for help. Those are the people, you know, you would look for to help you. And so processing all of this while living in Milwaukee, it's kind of been like a roller coaster, you know, because it's like almost a social trend that seems mm -hmm. to happen at times. You know, oh, this black person is killed. 
and Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. And then, okay, we're not going to talk about it. Tamir Rice happens, Black Lives Matter, Black And so living in Milwaukee, you're seeing all of this and you start, you know, once again, you're seeing the people who really are about it, the people who aren't really about it. And yeah, it's just daily trying to figure out, like, where do we go from here, mm. you know? And now that I have a daughter, you start even really deeply realizing that this is reality. I um, I won't say any names, of course, but I made a post on Facebook. It was something along the lines of, hey, this is my experience, because I wanted to speak out. I saw so many people, you know, kind of yearning to want to know, like, I, wow, I want to learn. So... I made a post. It was just like, hey, this has been my experience. Kind of the same things I'm, sh I'm sharing here. And at the end, I, you know, made a statement along the lines of, you know, now that I have a daughter, I really, really do not look forward to the day that I will have to tell her certain things that she can't do because she's black. Mm -hmm. Because of that fear of, well, if you do this and you're black, you might get shot. You might get a knee to your neck. And someone had the audacity to comment, I don't agree with you saying that you can't tell that your daughter can't do certain things because there are laws in place that allow her to do those things. She won't be hurt because, and she, you know, the person goes on and on. And it was just like, like, where do I even begin to tell you that these laws that you think are in place to protect the people are not in some cases not only black people even white people aren't being protected by these laws and yet you want to hide behind this sort of facade that you've created for yourself in terms of oh i have this to protect me when you really don't you know it's very disheartening as a black person when you see another black person killed and the first thing someone has the audacity audacity to say is well they shouldn't have been doing this well, they should have just been respectful. I have never seen any... Like, are you judge, jury, executioner? To say, because this person did this, they deserve to have been killed. Mm -hmm. If they hadn't done this, they wouldn't have been killed. Like, where is that humanity to where you can't just... Someone died. Someone lost a father or a mother or a son or a daughter. Someone died. And the first thing in your mind is, well, they shouldn't have been doing this, actually. Mm -hmm. Like, come on. You know, and, you know, when I made that post and that person commented that, it was just kind of like, I, I have no time, for, you know, for this. I have no time for this. Like, and I think about a week later, that person, you know, responded with something along the lines of, oh, I'm really sorry. I mean, it's, no, no. I mean, I'm all for growth and learning. But when I post something that's very emotional, that's very, you know, introspective, and I'm talking about my daughter, and your first response is to say, I disagree with you telling your daughter you, she can't do this and she can't do that because she's black. Like, that's really where your mind went. Your first, the first thing you wanted to respond to was that. So, yeah, that was just like, ugh. Yeah, we want to be right. And so if we see the world differently, or I think the... For whatever reason, the human first instinct is to be like, no, that's, you know, like, yeah. I want to correct you. And it's just like, listen, just shut up. Like, it's probably, and I have to tell myself that because I like to talk a lot. <laughs> I'm a person who likes to talk and I like to try and figure out mm -hmm. what's going on and how to make it better. So I might say, actually, or, well, what about, and sometimes it's best to just shut up and yeah. like, just feel for a moment. I, I really appreciate that transparency that's really helpful um let me see let's talk about advocacy for a minute i mean you mentioned um earlier that you, you're seeing people particularly after there's um publicized um you killing of black people whether by police or, or otherwise that seems like it, it's racial in nature there's this big spike of you know, advocacy for equality for the, the fact that black lives matter and um and people want to help. And so for somebody who maybe like me, maybe others who, um, you know, aren't black, mm -hmm. but we want to help, 
let's let's handle it on kind of two areas. First, what should they not do? Like, if you were to give some guidance and say, hey, listen, don't do that, and mm-hmm. then what would be helpful? Well, I think when it comes to what to not do is don't assume. Don't assume you know what, you know, the problem or the issue is. Uh, don't assume someone's experiences. Realize that this is simply about black lives, period. You know, I think starting to just put a period at the end of whatever your advocacy is, instead of adding the but, or the and, or what about. In terms of things to do, listen, learn. There are plenty of books out there, you know, um, I, I believe it's Charles Baldwin, I might be wrong. He's a great person to listen to. Um, Watch movies, like movies that show your history in a different way. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's mind boggling to me with how much technology we have that it's so simple. You know, we just talked about redlining. I'm sure if someone, you know, hears that, Google it. 20 minutes later. You you have your information there. And then um, another thing to not do is don't mm-hmm. disregard when especially, especially a person of color tells you, hey, this is what is happening. If the very first thought in your head is to say, but, or actually, and you know, I know you said that's something you might do, <laughs> but that's a very, very bad way to start a conversation. You really want to make sure you're just listening mm-hmm. and realizing you know, what the issues are. And with how much you know media there is out there, might not be the worst idea to start filtering the kind of media you're getting or you're receiving. Because it's very easy for someone to say, oh yeah, I am listening, I'm listening to this talk, or I'm listening to that person, I'm, I'm educated, I'm learning, I'm growing. Do some more research on that, you know, on the person who's telling you something. Or why, you know, instead of looking to go to a white person to learn about black people, maybe just, learn from the black person themselves, you know? And like I said, it'll be uncomfortable. I've had some white friends who have uh, made the statement that, well, I went to this black person and I wanted to know more and they just kind of rejected me. They didn't want to talk about it. That's okay. Find someone else to talk to. You know, when you ask someone, hey, what does racism feel like to you? I think it's fair if that person says, I really don't want to talk about that. I think that's a fair statement. You know, and not, you know, start not being afraid Mm. to venture out and to learn and to grow because as many setbacks as you may get from that, you know, the growth you're going to get is just, I mean, the white friends that I have in my life who have taken that step, who have been unafraid to go out there and you know, gain information and understand what really is the problem. What is systemic racism? What is white privilege? What, you know, what is voter suppression? What's all these things that are ingrained into the society we live in? The people that have gone out there and got that information come out a whole lot better. What, like, don't we all at the end of the day want to understand someone else? And if you can understand the system that someone has been living in, you will understand them that much better. Mm-hmm. And you start to understand someone else then you can even be a greater advocate because it's all well and good to post a black screen on facebook or on instagram for blackout tuesday that's great thanks you know or to post a meme about this or to post you know a meme about that but the more you actually understand you know once again like my experience the people listening that will hear this you know they just understood me a whole lot better They'll understand what I've gone through. They'll understand my, you know, sort of like makeup as a human. And the more people of color you start learning about, you one, you're probably going to see a lot of similarities and experiences. And I think that may start breaking down that wall of you saying there's no such thing as systemic racism. If you probably have a couple of people telling you there, there is such a thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think the qu- quantity of people like that you talk to, as you said, is really important. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just having watched the world try and react to what's going on, I see some people who are more or less in denial about things like systemic racism. They'll quote 
one black person that they, you know, or their black, black friend. friend. I, yeah, yeah. Exactly right. exactly I'm not racist. Right. I have and a black I friend. Think that's dangerous. <laughs> so like, dangerous. It's dangerous because you can find anybody to support what you want. Yeah. So it's, but it's really about understanding the narrative of so many people. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to argue against what somebody experienced. You exactly. just can't argue like, oh, wow, that's, but it, it's helpful for you and like in building your interpretation of the world. Yes. You need to understand what other what's happening to other people because if I just have my interpretation of the world based on the things I saw with my own eyes, like that's a pretty narrow perspective. Yeah. Like I I wish it was more broad. I <laughs> I need to like make a habit of making it as broad as I possibly can. Um but of course you can broaden it pretty dramatically just yeah. by being open to listening. So. I know for me one journey that I took was, you know, as much as I'm a black man and I'm disadvantaged by that, I am a man. I have privilege from that. You know, there's stories that my girlfriend would tell me and I'm like, I have never had to experience that Mm. before. I've never, you know, walked to my car and checked the back seat because I was afraid someone's there or, you know, I've never bought pepper spray, you know, because I've, I'm a man. I've, you know, I'm just like, oh, nothing's going to happen to me. So I know for me, that was a journey that I had to take to where I had a lot of my friends who are women that said, oh, actually, happy, this happened to me. This sexual assault happened to me. This, you know, violence happened to me. And the more and more women that were telling me these things, you can't deny it at that point. You know, it's very easy to be like, well, we, you know, we all know the lines that men love to say when a woman says something. And it's very easy to fall behind that line. Like, maybe she shouldn't. Or what if, what did she, oh, you start have you know, I started having those conversations with women and listening to the things that they were telling me. And I had moments of realization as to the fact that I have privilege as a man. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've ever gone shopping with a woman and you look at women's sizes across the board, <laughs> that will open your eyes right there alone mm. as to, you know, the pink tax. That's also a great conversation to talk about. And I know that if I went through that journey of growing as a man to understand women better, to understand their plight, to understand their disadvantage, to understand the system and how it really, really disadvantages them... I'm sure my white friends can start making that journey for black people to understand our plight, to understand what we've gone through, to understand what we're saying. And it's not easy. There'll be plenty of time. I had plenty of moments to where I was like, wow, I can't believe I used to think this way. I can't believe I used to say these things. I can't believe I just assumed this was a thing. And when you start having those little moments here and there, realization of how my experience is different from your experience, then you you, you can start getting somewhere. Yeah, there's a lot of shame, um, it, feelings of shame that we generally as human beings try to avoid. We don't like it. No. Um, and there's that sort of natural inclination of shame whenever you realize, holy crap, I was wrong. Yeah. Like, I was wrong. And so you feel terrible. And so it's like, that's okay. Like, that feeling initially of, oh, I feel terrible. I, I was wrong. Like, hopefully that's not something you carry with you. But it should be impetus to then say, all right, how do I grow? Like, how yeah. do I take this? Yeah. Like, I don't have to stay in my wrongness. And that's a, that's a gift, you know, that human beings are capable of change. Like, that's an amazing thing. So how do we, you know, understand, wow, I was not so good there, and there's probably areas of my life now that are not so good yeah. that that need to change, that I need to grow in. And so I want to do that. I want that to be a motivation. Sure, it means that there's going to be some pain involved, but it'll be better for me, it'll be better for you, it'll be better for, you know, hopefully anybody who comes into contact with exactly. me. Exactly, exactly. Well, that's all great stuff. I did want to talk about coffee for a minute, if we got a few minutes. Like, an experience of, of being happy in, in coffee. Um, and, uh, because I, the coffee world is a unique space. Yeah, I mean, I say this not because I work for Stone Creek, but it has been the best job I've had. The great thing about working in coffee is you meet so many different personalities, so many eclectic people, and... You know, my experience has been just 
learning, you know, and people's reactions to me, you know, I'm lucky I have a name like Happy. Usually that's a very easy icebreaker. It's a very good icebreaker. And like I've obviously worked in the uh, the Grand Ave location, which isn't open anymore, but that was a great experience. I got to see a lot of, you know, kind of uh, white collar workers come through, blue collar workers come through. Um, then I worked at the Glendale North Shore location. That was an experience in itself just because of the community that Glendale is and being able to, you know, see the vibe that's there. Mm -hmm. And to, you know, coffee almost, I've been saying this to my coworkers recently, it almost feels like I'm living in two different realities because coffee has given me sort of like a safe space. You know, I can come into work and kind of just like immerse myself in the work and you leave the work and you're kind of, you know, bombarded with the reality of the world that you're living in. Not to say I haven't, you know, Actually, I take it back. I haven't actually seen anyone say or do anything while I'm at work that really triggered me or that was like a red flag. Mm. So when I leave and I'm hit with stuff, you know, whether it be through social media or someone saying something or doing something, you're kind of taken back and it's like, oh, shit, this is what's going on right now. Um, and then obviously right now I'm working in Bayview, which, I, you know, it's a great community. It's a very, very... Uh, woke community in a lot of ways and so you know the safe space that coffee has given me plus the community that Bayview is has been really great to be able to have you know people don't realize what it means when you're black and every social media outlet you know is giving you all this rhetoric of what it is to be black and then you see someone who simply has a We Stand With You poster in their window or a Black Lives Matter um, poster or whatever the case may be because we're being told constantly, this is what you are. Hmm. And so to see that unity, to see that you know, camaraderie is great. And so I've felt that in coffee um, since I started. It's been a great, you know, almost like a great... Uh, second family I've made some friends who I still talk to you know to this day through coffee and so not only you know was it a very great learning experience for me because I knew nothing about coffee before I started in Stone Creek uh, so not only did I learn the craft of what it was but I also you know met some you know new people gained new experiences learned new experiences so Throughout all this, it's, you know, once again, it's almost like two different realities, seeing how, you know, the coffee industry, you know, it's it's very almost like safe space kind of. Sure. Yeah. For me, um, you know, I have a perspective in the business, which is me in my role doing what I do. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I'd say over the last two years, I have... Uh, picked up some skills in terms of learning what other people go through in the business on a daily basis and not sort of relying on my own eyes. But like in this particular moment, like is there anything, you know, as, as an employee of a company that you think would be important for the people who run the company? Like, hey, like you don't see this in your company right now. And um, even if you don't, if there's nothing like that in yeah. Stone Creek, just like I would want even in this moment, like what are some things you think that Stone Creek needs to look out for or we need to work on as we go forward? So I guess first I'll start with just like companies all around. Sure. And I think one thing that black people and people of color want to see, not saying I speak for everyone, but I would feel that what we want to see is practical change. You know, it's all well and good to post on social media. It's all well and good to, you know, release a mask or release a shirt that says we stand with you that's all well and good but at the end of the day we know that money is king so i think when people of color see these fortune 500 companies putting their money where their mouth is that will give some hope mm -hmm. in terms of okay you as a 
you know, millionaire, billionaire, six figure, whatever your salary is, you're willing to put your money into the cause. You're willing to put your money where your mouth is. You're saying this and this is what your money is doing. Okay, I will actually, you know, whether it be, you know, respect your, or you know, spend my money, whatever the case may be. Um, as for Stone Creek, I mean, starting off with when, you know, the, you know, the, out, the outrage from George Floyd began, that was such a great step to one, just be like, hey, we see you, we hear you, we know we're not you, so we don't know exactly what you're going through, but just know that we're here. So I think one, admitting that has been a great thing, already putting your money where your mouth is, like I mentioned before, and then not forgetting. You know, in six months' time, it's very possible that this will... You turn on, you know, media outlets nowadays, and people already... You can already see it's slowly but surely coming out of the media. You know, thousands of protests are still happening. You're not seeing them. You know, unless you're an avid social media user where you can see it on Instagram, you can see it on Twitter. Yeah. The average person is probably not seeing this on TV, you know. And the fact that it's coupled with the pandemic you have this other thing kind of drawing attention away from that, which, as it should, it's a very, very, you know, big issue in itself, but so is black lives. And making sure that, you know, Stone Creek Coffee doesn't just go with, you know, where, where's the social media hype at the moment? You know, will this still be, quote unquote, popular in November? You know, will black lives be popular in November? You know, it's like, let's not forget because once people, you know, you, I keep hearing the phrase, oh, I can't wait for stuff to just go back to normal. Well, that's what we don't want. <laughs> we really don't want things to go back to normal because normal means that you're getting, you know, a knee to your neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. That's not normal. Mm -hmm. So I think fighting against wanting to go back to normal, realizing that we don't want that normal. And if in December people are reminded that, hey, this is still a thing, you know, 400 years of systemic racism won't be overturned because, you know, a company donated a couple thousand dollars here. I wish it could, and that'd be super amazing, that'd be super great, but it won't. It will take the conversations to keep happening, it will take the experiences to keep being shared, it will take, you know, people to, you know, don't, don't take your foot off the gas. 400 years that's a long time <laughs> that's a, long a time. really really long time you know and it will it will it's, it will take a long time for real change to happen the montgomery bus boycott by bus boycotts took almost a year i can't imagine if someone right now said happy you're not driving home right now you're not taking the bus you're going to walk home and we want you in this cause for about a year can you do that for us Wow, what a, you know, what a request. But that's just one section of what people were willing to do for something they so strongly believed in. A year of not riding the bus, walking to work, carpooling, you know, blisters on your feet, heat, cold, you're sticking to this cause. And when that starts happening with, you know, whether it be through police reform, education, you know, everything that we've talked about, not letting your foot off the gas if it takes a year, if it takes two years, if it takes three years, realizing that if we're so serious about the change we want to see, we can't let it die out. That's great. Yeah, it's tough to be authentic mm -hmm. because we have more or less a social media mob that's very yeah. influential in, in our society. And so... There will be, I think, and in the days ahead, you'll see the those who are authentic and, and persistent and the challenges to be that, you know, which is, I think is a great challenge to kind of end with. If you say you care, that's great. Be authentic and hold it versus those who are just like, oh, I got to do this right now because people want it, or I got to take care of this right now, or I got to say this right now. And, you know, that's probably not as helpful a way to act. Yeah, and then, like, you know... Not all of us, you know, are running a company or anything like that. So for just like as an individual to keep up that change, once again, is to keep correcting, to keep learning, to keep growing and 
to embody this, you know, new, if your soul's staunch and, you know, you want this new America to start emerging, it starts from within on an everyday basis. What, you know, what are the conversations like that you're having amongst your white friends? What are the things they're saying about black people? What are the things they're saying about people of color? Do you agree with them? And if you do, but yet on the other side, you're saying, no, 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 I'm not racist. No, I don't want racism to continue in America. Well, it starts with, you know, that white friend you're talking to. Mm -hmm. So it might be popular now to, you know, wear a black, you know, Black Lives Matter t-shirt. Will you still be doing this, you know, next year? Will you still be correcting your friends next year when they say something that's very out of line? And if you won't, then you, the purpose has been defeated. But if you will, on an individual basis, person by person, and that, you know, leads to family by family, that leads to community by community, then real change will start to happen. Awesome. Dude, well, thank you so much for Thanks, sharing <laughs> so much. I mean, that's, it's just a really gracious act to say, you know, listen, I want to I wanna share. Um, that's an investment of yourself, um, and I'm, I'm certain it's for the greater good, but it, as you said, it's, it's totally appropriate, I think, for some people to say, listen, I don't want to talk about racism. Yeah. It's painful. It's traumatic, as you said earlier. That's totally fair. But you've offered up yourself for our education as a company and then for our guests and partners, and that's crazy valuable. Yeah. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, I just hope, you know, it helps. Yeah. You know, that's, that's about it. Yeah, I think it's going to take a few million conversations, <laughs> but one's the place to start. There you go. Uh, also want to thank uh, Attention Era Studios for producing this episode of the Stone Creek Coffee Podcast. Um, we don't have a nice setup like this in our digs, so this is just a, a real blessing uh, for our company um, and our good friends, uh, Aaron and Jenny Bieber, helping us out with this uh, particular episode of the podcast. And for those of you who have watched or listened to all of this, um, thank you for tuning in and for your desire to learn um, and to grow. Um, what we say at Stone Creek over and over again uh, is never stop learning. And it's you know, built on the conviction that, listen, who we are today is not necessarily who we're going to be tomorrow. And it's about growing. It's about gaining new experiences. It's about becoming more empathetic and more caring um, and hopes to create a better world. Just one little cup of coffee at a time. So that's it for this episode. We'll be having a few more here in the coming weeks as uh, we get rolling. So thanks again.